My name is Armini Scher. I was born in Mexico, in a little town in the state of Morelos. My birth name was Armonia Papkowis. That's a whole mouthful a lot of people had trouble pronouncing because in those days, children weren't named uh, that kind of name. So I anglicized it to Armony, and I legally changed it when I became a citizen at age 18. My parents uh, came from Russia and Poland, mother from Russia, father from Poland, and they lived in Paris uh, for a while, and then they um, migrated to, immigrated to Mexico, and in 1941, we immigrated to the United States. I'm Joyce Sindel, and I was born uh, at the White Memorial Hospital in Boyle Heights. I met Armini because she lived across the street from us, and I honestly didn't know how we met. I just thought we were playing, because that's what we did. We played. We played uh, in the street or on our front lawn or wherever it was. Uh, uh, Arlene lived down the street uh, from me on Folsom Street, and I remember her as a little girl with a lot of hair, curly, curly hair, which I was so envious of because I had very blonde, straight hair. My name is Arlene Dunnitz. In Boyle Heights, when I lived there, my name was Arlene Light. And I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. And my parents came here in the um, late 30s, probably, I believe, early 1938, because I started kindergarten here. And my mother always worked, but she, she sewed. So she was a power machine operator. She sewed women's sportswear in various terrible sweatshops in Los Angeles. And um, it was usually piecework. You know, if you did, if you were able to sew 20 garments or 20 whatever it was, you, then you had, and each one was 16 cents, then that, and I'd figure her, her pay for her. And so it was, you know, you were pushing yourself my mother came to America in steerage with the nine-month-old baby that she was nursing. I, I once visited a steerage of, a, of a, an exhibit and I thought, oh my God, that would be horrific. But that's how it was. She came with a child and she had another one, but like a year or so later, she was, she was never able to get any education. And my father was a shoemaker. My father worked at a, at a shoe store, a very prominent shoe store. My name is Helen Bialik. That's my married name. My maiden name is Helen Glazer. Uh, I was born in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, New York. My father was a fur operator. He made mink coats. My father was fluent in Yiddish. My mother was not. My mother was four years old when she came to England and she was very British in her manner. And I came to Los Angeles in 1942. My name is Charlotte Gusson Root. My father was born in Pennsylvania, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. My mother was born in Romania but came over as an infant. And uh, as far as I know, they met here in Los Angeles. My mother was a housekeeper. She never worked. Uh, after she was married. I, I believe she was a bookkeeper until she got married. And my father had a, a show card business, making little cards that go in the windows like under shoes to tell how much the, the cost was. And then when he closed that up, he went to work for the, for the railroad. My name is Jacqueline Marcia Waterman. I was born in Los Angeles. My grandparents on my, my mother's side were born in Romania and they moved to, uh, as soon as they got married and they were very poor, as most of the Jews were, they, they moved to Canada. They landed in Toronto, no English. My grandfather, when they got off, they became peddlers. He became a peddler. 
and had a car. Obviously, he did very well. When my aunt got married and moved to California, then my mother's family all migrated to Boyle Heights. And the reason they ended up in Boyle Heights is my grandfather sold his farm in Winnipeg, Canada. And uh, he obviously had money because he came here and he built three different duplexes. Uh, in Boyle Heights, which was the place to move. It was a very healthy place, and that's where the Jews were. There was no, there was no Beverly Hills. There was nothing. This would have been in the 20s. Uh, this book is, uh, this book is from 1944. Everybody knew everybody. Oh, well, there's Armini. Her, la her maiden name was Armony Pupkowitz, it was. She came from Mexico. This, she was my best friend. Here's another one. Well, when you get married and have twins, don't come to my house for safety pins. Lots of luck to my best friend and a swell kid. Yes, that's a word we used a lot. Swell. Isn't that swell? Well, you know, that, that is so dated. <laughs> My sister had a twin bed, I had a twin bed. I would have kids sleep, including Armony. As many as three girls in a twin bed. Two one way and the other one walk the other way. We were that thin. We could do that. And <laughs> Armony was over quite a bit. I must have walked at least uh, almost two miles, I think, to uh, the library. And I went there every week. In fact, I, I always took out 10 books a week. So my father once caught me reading under my cover with a flashlight, and he said, if you don't stop that and discontinue that, I'm going to take away your library card. So I didn't get to do that at night under the covers anymore. But I did read a lot, and I did read a lot at the library at the school. For instance, at Hollenbeck Junior High, they had a wonderful library, and because my mother was English, I used to read a lot about the kings and queens of England and the history of England, and I, I still follow it somewhat. The local library was a very central part of my life, and so I spent a lot of time getting books there, and uh, I used to read them all the way up to the house and all the way back down <laughs> on the street. Uh, it was a very important part. I did get down to the Central Library when I was going to UCLA, and sometimes on the weekend, uh, I would go down there to study. My sister, that was just eight years older than I, would have to comb my hair in the morning, get me ready for school, because my mother was at work. And, and I was an original latchkey kid, because once my sister graduated from high school and went to work, she, she wasn't there for me after school. Whereas previously, when she was in high school, she'd have to miss all the, any, any activity after school. She'd have to come home because she had her kid sister. She'd say, I have to take care of my kid sister. But, um, and I didn't realize till much later how much she gave up because she missed a lot of things that she might have liked to do. And we were very close, that sister and I. This is our yearbook, Hollenbeck Junior High School, Summer, 1947. We had to be in the uh, ninth grade. Yeah, we the graduating class. All right, so that's Shar, and that's Helen, and that's Arlene, and that's me, and that's Joyce. I moved to Boyle Heights about uh, the late 30s, perhaps, well, I started kindergarten in Los Angeles, so, and I, and I was born in 1932, and I did not start Sheridan until the second grade. But so. you were so friendly and outgoing. I mean, how many kids today would go up to somebody who's brand new and say, hi, my name is, and you're, what's your name, where are you from, or what, whatever. She, I knew she was, but she was that was so impressive to me. To have someone, okay. somebody who doesn't even know who I am, my first day in school, and, the, and uh, that part of the uh, playground was empty, but she appeared out of nowhere and, and 
and said, what's your name and everything. And that was so nice. I'm glad I did. I took piano lessons and when I was in elementary school and the piano teacher was a couple of blocks from the school and um, she lived in an apartment upstairs and I was supposed to go up from school every day and practice and she would leave a little piece of candy on the piano and so I would go up there and I'd go tink 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 about two minutes and then I'd grab the candy and then I'd go home. So for all those four years I can barely play chopsticks. So <laughs> I'm sorry about that. The senior class of 1950 at Roosevelt High School was called the Roundup. Here I am in Optimus. Here I am in Rostrum over here. And another one is on Charlotte Galfon route. You have to remember, we were born into the Depression. And the Depression wasn't over in six months. It lasted for a long time. So there were, it was hard years during, yeah. during our, was, you know, our youth. And I remember that we were able to work at the age of 14. They let us work. I worked at Thrifty's, at Thrifty Drug Store. Because of the war and the shortage of uh, people available to work, they let them hire young, young people. I also worked at May Company, mm -hmm. selling candy, which almost did me in. But, but Thrifty Drug Stores was a very busy place. Thrifty was in Boyle Heights, which on, is... On Soto. I mean, on uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Avenue. Avenue. You couldn't sell condoms if you were a woman. You had, a, 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 and a man came up and said, "This is what he wanted to purchase." You had to refer him to the the pharmacist. Is that <laughs> so? That's right. I didn't know what a condom was at that. <laughs> my first job working, I was probably in the sixth grade, was at my uncle Elmer Zellman's men's store. I would go there at Father's Day and at Christmas time, and I would wrap the packages. I worked at a dry cleaning store and I used to work on Saturday pretty much all day and um, and and I was paid four dollars for that day and I decided that I needed five dollars so this is the story and I asked my boss the woman for a raise I said I, I, I'd like you to, I'd like to have five dollars for, for Saturday and she said no. So, you know, I didn't argue or press it any further. I just didn't go back. The next week, one of my friends came by to say hello. And she sees this girl who was Marilyn Epstein. And she says, where is she? I need her. <laughs> she said, why, why didn't she come? What's wrong? Why? And so she runs to my house and she tells me and I, got five dollars thereafter. I, I wasn't playing hard to get. I just thought I wasn't supposed to go back if I if if she wasn't gonna pay me what I, and so I'm I at five at twelve years old so I got five dollars a day. That that's about sixty six or something cents an hour. It's nothing. I mean it's because it's that was all day. And then I used to go home for lunch. It was so close. Brooklyn Avenue was the main the main business street. And I remember my mother used to buy her poultry at a, at a store where there were live chickens. And they'd go in and pick out a, a certain chicken. And then there was, and they were all ki kosher killed. There was a certain man of oil who, who would say a prayer and then they'd kill them in the most humane way, I guess, whatever. And, uh, and I would have to sometimes go pick them up on Thursday, because then my mother would have a chance to cook for the Friday night. You know, if you wanted to make chicken soup, you made, you bought a chicken and you cooked the chicken and you made chicken soup. Grandfather opened up a shoe store on Brooklyn Avenue, which is now Senior Chavez, which was also close to Zellman's Men's Store, which they were all on Brooklyn Avenue and basically the same side of the street. I was in elementary school at Sheridan Street School. My mother uh, was pretty and avant-garde 
person, and she opened a store on Brooklyn Avenue, now known as Cesar Chavez, and she sold um, radios, large radios, refrigerators, um, stoves, etc., etc., and she did that as well as booking my dad's jobs. My dad was a, a plumber, plumbing contractor, and I remember our house always being, um, well, it just always was like the meeting ground. And in the back, my Uncle Jack repaired radios and whatever else people needed to have repaired. My, uh, my grandfather opened up a shoe store on Brooklyn Avenue, and um, then he gave my uh, uncle, Elmer Zellman, a store to open up a men's haberdashery, is what it was called. And that was there up until probably, uh, I'd say, 15 years ago. One day we had a friend, the, the, a, a man who we've all known since elementary school, and he joined us for one of our lunches, the group mm -hmm. of six women. And uh, he asked us what was on the um, nor the northeast corner of Brooklyn and Soto. Well, we all knew it was it was it was Curry's Mile High Ice Cream. I said, "Well, what's on the southeast? What's across the street?" And then someone said, "Oh, that was Detroit Bakery." No, I said, "I that was a bakery my mother sent me to." Detroit Bakery was farther down on Detroit, on, you know. So I mean, it we it was just comical. We just what was the name of the other bakery? Detroit I bakery. don't know. Bernard told us, but I don't remember. Well, my friend's grandparents owned the Detroit Bakery until uh, uh, after the war. They lost it. They lost it. It was Rosner's Bakery, I believe, and that was near the bank, right next to the bank. Because oh. I used to go there on. Friday and pick up a, a challah for, for dinner. And it was a square twist. <laughs> that means it was a pan loaf. It wasn't a braided, but the top was braided, so that was a square twist. Arlene and I used to go to the Brooklyn Theater quite regularly, and then we'd go right up the street. There was a, a Mexican restaurant, a small restaurant, and we would have Mexican food there, and we loved it. There were three theaters, the Brooklyn, the National, and the Maralta. We frequently we would go on a Saturday, let's say, to the theater. A bunch of the kids would get together. Warsaw Bakery was one of the suppliers to the famous. Uh, it's that kind of bakery, like corn rye breads, um, pastries, Danish pastries, etc. And there was another one across the street, uh, Star the, Bakery. And there was the, the, the Detroit Bakery. And Rosner's Bakery and yeah. Detroit Bakery. Yeah. There were like four of them yeah. right, right within three, four blocks. Mandel Meat Market at Greenstein's on the corner, across the street from where you live. I hated going there. Oh, Mr. Mean... Greenstein would go, Joycey! Like, mm. <laughs> My parents had a store on First Street, first in Chicago, so it was maybe, I used to think it was a long way, but it was really like four, five blocks down to, uh, from our house to their store. It was a general bargain store, that was the name of it, and they sold, just like it said, lots of everything. Uh, not used, everything was new. But a lot of the clothes were like um, last year's uh, designs or leftovers or sometimes seconds, irregulars or stuff that other stores had um, had uh, not sold and, and turned back to the manufacturers. And my mom used to go down to the garment district by P car, the streetcar, and she would go there and buy all the stuff and then they'd pack it up for her and she'd carry it back on the streetcar. I went to Cantor's frequently for sandwiches because they had the best corned beef sandwiches did and the you, best coleslaw. Did you go frequently? Well, I went about once a month. The yeah. Jewish section of Boyle Heights, however however many miles or whatever, really was, it was north of First Street as far 
north as Wabash. There was an area that was almost totally Jewish. People who did live in the neighborhood were very friendly, especially the children, were very friendly with each other, and it was more like a small village. I think we, we moved uh, among the different cultures quite well. Uh, our neighborhood was uh, a combination of Latino, of uh, Catholic families. Uh, everyone, there was never any incidents of any, any trouble that I know of. Um, when we lived in Boyle Heights, as I remember correctly, it was mostly a Jewish neighborhood. Uh, we did have a Mexican neighbor right next door on the street that we lived in, but it was really uh, very, pretty much, um, I wouldn't know how, what percentage, of, but it was a pretty Jewish neighborhood. I and mean, the markets and the, the delis and the bakeries were all um, pretty Jewish, yeah. Uh, in the school, it was a little different. In um, elementary school, it was more of a mixture, quite a few uh, Mexican children. What we did was we, we were very active with B'nai B'rith, B'nai B'rith girls, and we met every week. The organizations, there were so many. There were so many at the uh, Soto Michigan Center. That was for, mostly for younger people. I was in the Habonim. Uh, I, we went to the Jewish Community Center because that's where we, the Gabeth meetings were held. And I do recall that the first time I ever saw television on a little, like, 12-inch screen was at, the, at that center. Olive Zedek, Olive, what they called AZA, as a group for young men to, for, you know, to get together and meet each other and have social events. For the adults, I think they were very active in Workmen's Circle. They were very active in voting groups. It was all focused on bettering the people who lived there. And then, of course, also the Breed Street Shul was right there. And my grandmother, I would walk with her to the shul on the high holidays. And my mother, by the way, was not at all religious. We lived next to Grandma. Grandma was religious. Breed Street Shul was orthodox, very orthodox. The women all sat upstairs. The men and women were always separated. They were never even allowed to go down on what they would call the bima, which was downstairs. And Grandma would only go, we would walk there for the high holidays. And uh, that was a big thing for us to do. Now, as it happens, we lived right next door to the senior rabbi, who was Rabbi Zilberstein. And um, I never understood in those days, but he would walk ahead and his wife would walk behind him. And I, of course, have since found out that's basically a European uh, something that the Jews did a lot in, in, in Europe. Oh, Rabbi Silverstein would come open up our door and walk in and turn on our radio. <laughs> Don't ask me why, I can still remember that. Well, he was king, you understand. Yiddish was spoken in my, in my house, so although I don't speak it, I understand most of it. When my mother's father came over occasionally, my grandfather, and he only spoke Yiddish, and so I could never really talk to him, but I do remember that he always brought us candy. That's the most I remember about him. My grandmother spoke Yiddish to me. She could speak English, but she was much more comfortable with Yiddish. I would answer her in English. On Sundays, there was a Mr. I think it was Friedman, had the Jewish hour. We would always listen to the Jewish hour. And I remembered, I understood everything in those days. And then there was also the forward newspaper which was in Yiddish, uh, not Hebrew. There was a difference between Hebrew and Yiddish. People in those days, if you spoke Yiddish, you might have a different dialect, but you could call anywhere in the world. The, the Jews would be able to converse to some extent. There was a, a newspaper, a Jewish newspaper, called The Forward, or The Four Vits. My, not my mother, my mother didn't read those papers. My father did. Well, at one point, my mother did become rather proficient in Yiddish. 
And when I tried to talk with my husband in Yiddish so my children wouldn't understand what I was saying, they went to the library and looked up Yiddish books and then translated what we were saying into the English. My mother would speak to me in, in Yiddish, and um, I pretty much understood everything. There were was, there was some, some things that I didn't understand, but most of the things. But now they, when they wanted to, when they didn't want me to understand, I don't know exactly what they spoke, if it was Polish or Russian, but they could communicate in that way. So I knew they were talking about s secret stuff. My mother and dad spoke Yiddish as the language they didn't want us to understand. Otherwise, it was English spoken at home. And unfortunately, I never really learned Yiddish, so I could never uh, talk to my grandmother. My first language was Spanish, and I knew absolutely no English. My parents spoke eight, nine, seven, eight languages. Uh, they were, you know, in Europe, you travel around the countries and you learn these languages. They spoke uh, mostly Spanish in, in the house. Between them, they spoke in Yiddish. Uh, sometimes they spoke in, in, in French. I Basically, the Yiddish or Spanish, uh, the, the two main languages I remember. Then I learned Yiddish when I was going to the folk show. I used to send little letters to my aunts in Mexico in, in Yiddish. I don't think I could do it today. I remember horse wagons with horn, with a horse and a, and a big cart and a man would come around and I my the, we lived in a large flat in in and we were right next to an alley and I we would see someone come by on a ho horse with with wagon he was in the wagon not on the horse collecting rags or whatever and even an ice wagon early on that ended most everybody had refrigeration by that time. But I remember that there were horse carts. Well, the way you got around mostly was walking. Oh, we walked everywhere. Uh, we, we walked everywhere. And streetcars and buses were the only tr means of transportation to other parts of the city. There were no freeways then. Very few people had cars. Uh, gas was like 19 cents a gallon. They had a, a light and it would shoot up if it was go and it would come down and say stop. Uh, there was a bus on Brooklyn Avenue, there was a bus on Soto Street, there were street cars all over the place. There was a television. There was no such thing as Facebook years ago and there wasn't any way of communicating unless you talked directly to the person. That's right. Oh yes. There was always that. You could always talk to someone or call someone. You had party lines, you didn't have one person to a telephone. So if there was not you shared your line with, it was on the phone, you couldn't use it until they got off. I remember years later going to uh, a Girl Scout camp and they had a washing machine with a ringer and, and nobody knew how to use it. And I knew how to use it <laughs> because that's what we had. And then you had to have, you, there was no dryer. Everybody hung the clothes on a clothesline. Uh, there was also Helms Bakery that used to come around and sell stuff. I remember there was a, an egg lady who would come with eggs and she would walk a, quite a distance to just bring eggs. Most people did not drive. Most women didn't drive in those days. My mother made wonderful noodles. Oh, her, her homemade noodles were, were the best. Um, and then she'd spread a clean, a clean towel, dish towel or sheet on the bed and let her let them dry. My mother was quite a cook. She knew how to make all sorts of things that, that I would never undertake. The lenses, for example, the filter fish. She made those things. But you could buy, you could still buy them. But she always made them. There was a time when women did. Uh, it was it was a different time. My aunt, my father's sister, was active in Workman's Circle, and she brought home a book when I was uh, about twelve, or not even that, called the Black Book, and it told about the what was happening in the concentration camps in Europe, 
and it it just upset me so much and I was I was sad about that because a lot of my ha my family was a very big one when I was born I had 28 aunts and uncles mm. and and uh, some of the well, not first cousins or second cousins but beyond that were in Europe I worried a lot about that because there was a there was an active uh, Hitler group here in Los Angeles uh, I only lost one cousin uh, during the Second World War, and uh, still I remember going to his wedding, and I remember how 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 people felt. I mean, there was a it wasn't as if uh, something happened in a distant land that um, you felt that this distance and that it didn't involve you. But the people that I associated with, that my family associated with, took all these incidences that we heard about that Hitler had happened to the people in these towns. They felt it as an immediate personal attack on themselves and their families. And because a lot of their relatives were in, still in Europe and may have been in concentration camps, they felt that it was happening within themselves. And they felt very, very bad. And they had, they had demonstrations here in Los Angeles. I remember as, as a very young child, when Hitler invaded Poland, because my mother was from Poland, we, there was I was so terrified that, that he was going to come here too. And my, my parents said, no, no, that's far away, we're, we're okay. So I think I always had this feeling that we, you know, it was, it was a small world, but we were, we were safe. I don't have that feeling anymore, because, that, because it isn't true. We were active. We played. We played at recess. We played at lunch, even before school. And even though I played pickup sticks and, and jacks, I did jump rope too. And, and we had tetherball. We had all kinds of things. We played um, over the wire. I mean, there were telephone wires. Nothing was underground, so there were telephone wires. And if you stood on. Um, uh, opposite sides of the yard, you had to throw a ball over the wire and somebody had to catch it. And I think you were not supposed to hit the wire. We played steps. Um, steps was um, also a ball game. You had to throw the ball onto the steps and as it came back you had to catch it before and if it hit the end of the step, it was better. I, <laughs> in fact, the house that I lived in at 2518 still has the same red steps because I took a picture of that. Uh, we used to play Spud Stop. <laughs> well, if you were it, you would, <laughs> you would have to turn your back on everybody else. And then you would call one, two, three, Spud Stop, turn around. But everybody else could could run, but they had to stop. And if they didn't, you could catch them, <laughs> and they would be it. Mm. Uh, what else did? We, oh, off uh, something about the gutter. Uh, three feet. Off, oh, three feet off the gutter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was interesting because when my own kids were very small, we made a stop going, and they said. Where did you play? I go, what do you think we played? We played in the street. We play. My parents were living in Paris and they were very politically active. They were pacifists and my father refused to uh, fight in the army, go into the army. My parents were anarchists. They were pacifist anarchists. And so Fran said, you either go in the army or you stay in jail or you get out of the country. So he ended up going to Spain, some kind of a political exile type program. And he spent time there until another country would accept him, which was ended up being Argentina. And he got on the ship to go to Argentina and people he met on the ship said, no, no, you don't want to go to Argentina. You go to Uruguay. Montevideo, so he, that's where he ended up. My grandmother, Rose, Rose Fairman, was um, 
in charge of taking her family to the United States. She got from Torev to Bremen with her children and somehow she was bilked out of her money so they ended up coming in steerage. Meanwhile, my mother went back to Russia because she wanted to, to participate in the formation of the new government and she was active there. Uh, by then, the Bolsheviks were in power and um, she was not a Bolshevik, she was a Menshevik. While they were living in Paris, they became acquainted with Trotsky and his wife. She told me that when she went back to, um, to Russia, she saw Trotsky and he, she said, that, you know, I bring you greetings from your wife. And he said to her, welcome back, Sonia. Um, and she said, that's the last time she saw, spoke to him, the last time she ever saw him. So they never made contact with him when he uh, arrived in Mexico. She was very active politically, uh, passing out um, brochures and uh, uh, propaganda type things. And so uh, ended up in a lot of trouble and uh, was picked up, put in jail, and uh, ended up being sent to Siberia for a year. My mom uh, came from Poland Sokolov, Poland, and my grandfather had been in the Polish army where he learned to like all kinds of, quote, unkosher food. While in Siberia, she had trained, had some training as a midwife, and again, she was like my father, not necessarily in jail, although she did spend time locked up. But then being way out where there was nowhere she could really go to, there was a town nearby and they were eventually given some freedom to be in the town. So she did a lot of uh, deliver babies and other such things um, in the town and earned a little extra money and eventually was able to escape from there, made her way back to um, uh, Moscow. Meanwhile, my father found out that she had been sent to Siberia, and so he decided to go back and try to help her escape. They met up again in uh, Moscow, and um, from Moscow they stayed there for a little bit of time, then they went to Paris, and uh, again had to leave and left and decided to go to Mexico. I suspect that one of the reasons they went to Mexico is because my father had learned Spanish, um, and they both knew French, so Spanish would be easier. My grandmother, Esther, was very uh, European, very kosher, and uh, they first came to um, England. It's all very cloudy to me, but somehow or the other, the Farbstein family arrived in St. Louis, why did they come to Boyle Heights? I don't know. My parents were very active politically in Europe. So for many reasons, they ended up going to Mexico. Between 18, 1918 and 1921, more or less. We moved to Boyle Heights sometime in 1942. I spoke not one word of English. My father did not drive, and my parents did not speak English at all at this point, and um, I, had, I have an older brother, he's six years older than I, so he must have been all of 15, 14 or 15 when we moved, and he drove the family in an old car from Ciudad Juarez, where we lived for a couple of years, waiting for our papers to come through to emigrate to the United States, and then he drove all the way to California. and. Um, because my, my parents didn't drive. We didn't belong to a synagogue, but I did attend Cornwall Street Synagogue, especially at holiday times. And my father wasn't a religious person, and I think a lot of it had to do with financial uh, reasons. We identified as Jews, and we practiced a lot of the things that happen in a normal family of Jewish people but we did not belong to uh, a synagogue. My mother was raised in an Orthodox family, so a lot of what we did was uh, we couldn't, we were not allowed to write on Saturday, which was the Sabbath. 
uh, and this is a carryover from my mother's uh, learning. Uh, we weren't allowed to, uh, you know, carry money on Sabbath, and it was a, it was, it was a lovely feeling of being encompassed in a larger group. I used to go to a Jewish school at the Volkshul, which was on Soto Street, and it was um, strictly uh, Yiddish. We would learn to read and write Yiddish, and we uh, learned about the literature, the, all the good the writers, Yiddish writers, and about the history of the Jewish people. And uh, so it was mostly cultural. Uh, there was no religion involved. And I remember the newsboys running up and down the streets, waving the newspapers and announcing that the war had been declared, that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And so it was right after the war that we came to Los Angeles. I remember during the war when, when there was gasoline rationing and you had very little gasoline because it was needed for the army. I went to the Wabash Library regularly and it was a walk. Nobody was driven to school. Nobody was driven to the library or to anywhere. First of all, there was no gasoline during the war for anything but, but what you might want to do special with the family on Sunday, for example. You had stamps. You had, there was gas rationing. Um, certain days uh, you could drive your car and you couldn't get sugar, butter, Meat was in short supply, um, many things. And I know my mother used to switch her stamps for sugar and gave it to uh, a lady who would help us out sometimes in the house. And she would give us uh, the butter stamps. And you would switch these kind of things and try and manage that way. Except when there was canning time, when there was canning, Mom needed all the sugar she could get, and they would have these big vats, and you would can all your fruits and vegetables. Of course, we were all big on buying the stamps, the saving stamps, and then the, turning them into bonds. So we'd buy 10 cents at a time or, you know, whatever, and then turn them into, into savings bonds. We also had uh, newspaper collections, that, newspaper drives. We used to have uh, collect tin foil from the bubble, from the gum, from the gum wrappers. This was during World War II. I went to the city hall every Saturday and became a runner for Captain Mabel Patton. As a runner, what you did, they would give me things and I would have to take them to different offices. And this all had to do with the war. And um, I have no idea what I was running, but I, I was a runner. Living through uh, the war, when we were living in Boyle Heights, uh, you know, things changed a bit. Things were not available. Sometimes there was uh, rationing. Uh, socially, of course, a lot of the people, um, first of all, a lot of the Japanese people were sent, all the Japanese people were sent away. I did not have any Japanese friends at the time. I was more affected by, uh, I remember being at the Meralta Theater one night and seeing a group of uh, sailors, uh, U.S. sailors, come in and shine the lights at the legs, at the feet of all the people sitting there and pull out any that they thought were zoot suiters. And that was really scary to have uh, seen all this happen. And I also saw uh, busloads of servicemen uh, come down um, First Street uh, and beating up uh, some of the zoot suiters. I used to go, I remember I was in junior high school. This was during the war. There were no men around and the women were all working if, in the war industry. They, any warm body that could be an usher at the Philharmonic, or the Biltmore Bowl, it was called, across the street, could be an usher. Now, I loved to go to the plays and the operas and all, and I ushered. I did too. You too. So did I, and I have the programs. 
Yeah, Civic Light Opera Association, that's where we used to see most of the shows. The Philharmonic was in that church building, and we would climb, 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 climb to the tip. Mary, Mary was her name, who was the charge of the uh, volunteers. I remember, you have the programs, but I remember. <laughs> Now, on Sundays frequently during the World War II, my dad would drive us to Hollywood to see the war, the newsreels. And we would watch the newsreels. You know, when we used to see a lot of the war movies uh, at the theater, and of course the, uh, the newsreels that they used to have all the time, and the sound of the airplanes dropping bombs, I still, to this day, when I hear the sound of airplanes coming by that make that similar sound, it just takes me right back to it. I remember being at Safeway on First Street with my mother during the war, and bread was hard to come by. So she, she got hold of a loaf of bread and she put it in a wagon, turned around to get something, and someone stole her <gasps> bread. Mm. And you had to have coupons for that, I believe. One of the fashions I remember were these great big bell skirts with uh, appliques on them, you know, like... In high, that, was, that was in high school. Yeah, that was in high school. But that was in 48, 49, 50. And I remember people being very creative and cutting out animals and being attached with chains, poodle. leashes, and po yeah, poodles. Poodle. And, and, I uh, had a poodle haircut. Yes. And I remember in high school, we wore long... Narrow skirts. I was skirts. just going to say that there were the pencil skirts. It was hard to run in them, that right. was for sure. Sweater sets, I remember, were popular when we were in high school. I didn't have enough money to be concerned about fashion. I was very lucky that I could find suitable things to wear. But I did envy one or two of the girls in high school that had a million sweaters. Always had a sweater and always it seemed like new. But uh, for me, I was glad that I had something to wear, actually. And I'll never forget this, Joyce shoes. Uh, I, oh, I always me. wanted. And they were $20, which I was never a them. lot of money. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and every day when I would get home from school, I would get my white polish out, I would polish them and buff them. My mother would take us to Bullock's August sale and buy us a complete wardrobe for school. And there was only one sale a year, period. Not every day, right. but every week as we have now. And people from all over the city would come very early in the morning and go shopping. And same thing for Magnet, also had once mm -hmm. a year sale. And people would line up from all over Los Angeles, including Beverly Hills and go shopping. The famous was the one and only white tablecloth restaurant on Brooklyn Avenue. Joyce Sindel's family owned the famous restaurant. That was the name of it, the famous restaurant. And that was located on Brooklyn Avenue, just facing Cornwall Street. And uh, we couldn't go there very often, but when we did, it was just, it was, it was very, very nice. It was a special occasion to be able to, for us to be able to go there. Well, it was 1942, and my mom closed the store, and my dad uh, decided that he and Uncle Nicky would buy this neighborhood restaurant, which was like the iconic, um, white tablecloth linen restaurant in the neighborhood. And it's called The Famous. People from uh, City Hall managed to do that for lunch and so forth. So that, um, yeah, that was pretty interesting. My dad died in 1954, and they were in the process of opening another famous restaurant on La Cienega, and um, in fact it did open, and my dad was uh, managing the one in Boyle Heights, and my brother stepped up to help do that, and the one on La Cienega was um, just north of Melrose.
we didn't go out uh, very much once in a while, but if we went out yeah. as a family, we went with, remember, we didn't have a, a car either, so we were pretty limited. But since my parents had the store, uh, every so often on a Sunday, we'd go out to dinner as a family and we'd go to the famous. Really? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's a wonderful thing to have this sort of situation occur because a memory is something that can't be reconstructed after a person died. And after a community, uh, elders pass away, they take with them a history that we can't replicate any other way. And so recording a history, of a verbal history, of what people experienced is, is just so superior to anything that a writer could accomplish later and, and try and, and tell what happened. Far off upon the hillside, I hear the sound of playing. Sarah's banda, Sarah's banda, Sarah's banda, etc. Sarah's banda, Sarah's banda, Sarah's banda, etc. Da 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 Yeah. We love each other.